OK, so where did the idea of punctuated equilibrium come to these guys? Mainly because Gould was not a biologist. He was certainly not an evolutionary biologist. What he was was a paleontologist. He studies, studied fossils. He studied the history, the evolutionary history of fossils. And apparently, like totally separate of his large theoretical models, he was like the world's expert on the evolution of some Caribbean snail shell over the last 10 billion years or something. He's one of those paleontologists who traces lineages of evolutionary change over the course of time with fossils, fossil records as the readout. So he's a paleontologist slash geologist in some ways. And when you do that, you notice something, which is you got gaps in the record. You've got your famed missing links. You have gaps in your evolutionary record there of what the fossils look like. And you're measuring some trait or other in these snails or trilobites or whatever you're looking at. And at this time period, the trait looks like this. And at this time period, it looks like this. And this looks like a perfectly good gradualist model. And what Gould would notice is as the field got more and more information, more and more intervening steps on a lot of these fossil histories, they would start to look more like this. And every now and then, you would see something like this in between. And from that, that began to suggest to him this model of punctuated equilibrium. Most of the time, as assessed by the fossil record, nothing dramatic is happening, long periods of stasis. And what allowed this to occur is that for some fossils, you have incredibly detailed evolutionary history where you can begin to fill in the lines, and they wind up looking punctuated in this way. So out of him, comes this whole theory that it's all about punctuated equilibrium rather than gradualism. Right off the bat, what are the consequences of that? Little genetic changes don't matter. Competition driven by the notion of little changes mattering aren't actually occurring. A model saying most of the time, all of the notions of if you figure out the right kid to kidnap when the big guy is coming at you and you'll leave more copies and figuring out exactly who to be infanticidal to, all that, it's not going to make a difference in terms of gene distribution. Evolution is not being driven by that. And out of it came this very strong indictment of the sociobiological view of what you got there is a world where it's all about competition, where it's all about hierarchy, where it's all about domination, where it's all about that. Hey, isn't that interesting that that's exactly the sort of world that these folks live in who are benefiting from this, who started this theory? Very different notion here. Competition, selective advantages, all of that. Most of the time, nothing's happening. So not surprisingly, all of the evolutionary types from last week did not like this one bit. And this was attacked left and right in some extremely valid ways. First one, first form of attack is a very simple problem there, which is uh, that you have two different disciplines happening here. <clears throat> you get a paleontologist and you get a evolutionary biologist, and they're functioning in completely different universes. <laughs> okay, stomach problems, and they're functioning in completely different universes there. What counts as fast for a paleontologist? These are tens of millions of years going on. Whoa, incredibly fast evolutionary change going on there. Dram That's like 100,000 years. That's like, are you kidding me, said the biologists, the ones who study one generation at a time. That is asinine. That is ridiculous. This is them imposing models where this has absolutely nothing to do with how evolution actually works. These geologists got completely thrown off. And these paleontologists, led by Gould, simply orders of magnitude different scale of time yeah, maybe in some rough approximation of what they look at, but they're not studying evolution because they're not biologists. Next critique. The next one made lots of sense also, which was you're not just an evolutionary biologist, but you're one who thinks about the evolution of the brain or the evolution of skin 
melanism or the evolution of eye color or the evolution of how many chambers in your heart you're going to have or the evolution of any of these things that will leave no record whatsoever in the paleontological record because all paleontology is about is shapes of stuff, fossils. Fossils do not tell you what kind of brain was going on inside that fern. Fossils do not tell you anything about internal organs. Fossils do not tell you anything about behavior. So at this point, all of the evolutionary folks of the school from last week attack and say, yeah, what do they expect? They're studying the most boring possible things, the morphology of organisms. Ooh, just because the fact that humans over the last like million years or so have not evolved sort of getting rid of the large trunk and roots that they have during like springtime and now they don't have them. Oh, that morphological change didn't occur. So obviously there's been stasis. Give me a break. What is interesting about evolution and evolutionary change, paleontologists can't pick up because all they can study are forms, morphology. So that was a big attack on these folks. So you've got the Gouldian folks, the punctuated equilibrium people, saying when you look at the fossil record, it's not gradualism. And we've got some really complete ones. And to this day, the majority of fossil pedigrees where there are very, very complete records show patterns of punctuated equilibrium. And back come the rejoinders. This is ridiculous, the time span they talk about. That makes no sense. In this period, humans evolved doubled their brain size in the length of time that they call a very rapid evolutionary change. Their time span is completely crazy and they can't study the evolution of anything that's interesting because they study fossils. But in lots of ways, the best rebuttal, the one that most got at these folks advocating punctuated equilibrium would be the gradualist saying, show me a molecular mechanism show me some way in which you can get rapid change and then long stasis, turn that into modern molecular biology, which is occurring two minutes after the micro, microevolutionary people were trashing the folks from last week saying, you need to look for the actual genes. It's not enough just to make up stories. And once these folks had assimilated what evolution is, looks like on the genetic level, mutational level, micro mutational changes, they loved genetics. They loved the molecular end of it because they could now turn around to the Gouldians and say, show me the genes and show me the mutations that will account for stuff like this because you can't account for it because we all know classical genetics and mutation, you don't get that, you get gradualism. So this was a period of enormous hostility between the two camps and the gradualists called the punctuated equilibrium people evolutionary jerks. Ha <laughs> ha. And the punctuated equilibrium people called the gradualists creeps. Uh, so ultimately, they all got along wonderfully because they were so witty. But what you had was enormously hostile camps and really quite hostile because all sorts of implications spreading beyond like how fast the shape of this like seashell was going to be evolving. And when it first came on in the 80s, all of this controversy, the punctuated equilibrium people didn't have a word to say with the show me the molecular mechanisms. Show me mechanisms for mutation that will produce rapid change. And everything that has occurred since then in the world of molecular genetics that has been most striking has supported punctuated models, ways in which the micro-mutational, micro-evolutionary stuff of an hour ago is not what's going on an awful lot of the time. 